Time to elevate. everybody welcome to running on empty i'm matt and i'm tony and we are running on empty and today uh we're really looking forward to this one tony we have a special guest back again and uh let's uh let's jump right into it yes we've got our friend mike mccabe and we're going to be talking with mike about the state of democracy and the state of america or i guess maybe the state of democracy in america yeah Uh, Mike is the former executive director of the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign. He's written a couple of really great books, uh, Blue Jeans in High Places and Unscrewing America, uh, two of my favorite books, actually. And uh, more recently, Mike has just uh, started a Substack column. People can find it at mikemccabe.substack.com. I have subscribed to it, and I would urge all of our listeners to also. It's called More Verb Than Noun. Mm -hmm. And Mike says it's a blog about how we can't have democracy unless we do democracy and other thoughts on what America was, what it is now, and what it's becoming. Mike, thanks for being here. We appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Good to be with you. So what, uh, of course, why did you start this Substack? Well, you know, I suppose I probably should have started a podcast or maybe uh, done a YouTube show because that's what's done nowadays. But to be honest with you, uh, part of the reason that I chose the Substack platform is because I want to do my part to keep the written word alive. Good for you. And, and so I decided to do a blog instead of a podcast or a, or a YouTube show. Uh, I, I just think it's critically important to keep the written word alive. And then given the moment that we're living in, which is a very da- dangerous, very perilous moment when it comes to American democracy, I wanted to, I wanted to do a blog that, didn't focus on the latest outrage or Mm -hmm. the news of the day that everybody's stirred up about, but rather focuses on the deeper problems and the deeper challenges and the, and the opportunities that are under the surface that we're not thinking enough about or paying enough attention to. So the, the blog posts really aren't about, the latest outrage that, mm-hmm. that has everybody screaming at the television screen. Uh, it, it, it's really about the bigger challenges facing our society and our democracy and what we might do about all of that. Once again, our listeners can find it at uh, mikemccabe.substack.com and it's uh, it's for free. And I really appreciate, Mike, the fact that you will uh, get out your insights for free. I like to do think that I do the same also, and I believe that knowledge is for everyone. And, you know, let's talk about some of your columns. You know, you know one of your more recent ones is called The Long, Slow Trek to Insurrection. I just read that one. That one's Yeah, awesome. where you, in that column, Mike, you talk about how for years, as you've been giving talks, invariably, there will be people who will insist that, America is not a democracy. <laughs> America is a republic. And, and what have you pulled from that over the years? Well, you know, I, I what a lot of people don't know about me is that I once worked for three assembly Republicans. Wow. Uh, wow. Back in the early 1980s, I was a legislative aide. And the Republican Party was was a radically different party than it is today. Yeah, it, it, what I saw then really bore no resemblance to what you see now in the Republican Party. These were sort of Main Street Republicans, state legislators from the north uh, of our state, and and at that time, what I heard from them was celebration of democracy. The, you know, people would often say, "Well, it was true or not, whether whether." <laughs> Whether, whether they had grounds to say it or not, they said it all the time, that America is the world's greatest democracy. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. That's what I, I heard all the time. It wasn't until 2003 or 2004, and I, and to be honest with you, I don't remember which year it was precisely. I started getting emails and phone calls from people who really took exception to the name of the group I was running at that time, the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign. And they were saying, you know, America is not a democracy, it's a republic. And I would say, well, the two are pretty much interchangeable terms. You know, a, a democracy is you know, or a republic rather is a representative democracy. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that we have direct democracy in America, but we have a representative democracy yeah. and, that, and that's a republic. And they wanted none of that. They, wow. you know, they said that, that this is not a democracy at all. It's a constitutional republic. It's a, it's a nation of laws. It's, and, and we're, we're guided by those constitutional principles, not by mob rule, not by the will of the people. And, and I said, well, you know, you go back to the founding of the nation, and there was a lot of debate among the founders about, about those very questions, and they struck a balancing act. Mm -hmm. they, they struck a balance between, between uh, giving people the ability to exert their will, but also having protections for, for minorities, laws protecting against the, you know, overreach of, of the majority. And, but yeah, it's a, it, we, we have elections, we elect right. representatives, this is a democracy. And, and they were insistent that, that this is not a democracy, it's a Republican. And I really didn't know what to make of it back then. I, I, I had never encountered that before. Maybe that kind of talk predated 2003 or 2004. I didn't run into it. But all of a sudden, I was getting a, a lot of it. And I didn't see it for what it really was. Mm -hmm. uh, this was part of an active propaganda campaign to set the stage for minority rule in this country. Yes. And yes. it wasn't until years later when you started seeing the gerrymandering of legislative districts mm -hmm. and the packing of courts with right-wing extremists and you and you you know and and you saw presidents being elected without winning the popular vote but winning the electoral college and eventually this leads all the way up to the insurrection of January 6th of 2021 an attempted coup, an attempted overthrow of the government to keep someone in power who not only lost the popular vote for president, but also lost the electoral college vote, right. still wanted mm -hmm. to stay in power and was supported by an awful lot of people in that endeavor. And when I reflect on January 6th, when I reflect on all of these, you know, the voter suppression policies and all the other things that have been done mm -hmm. to to erode democracy and sort of bring about minority rule in our country. I thought back to those conversations in 2003 and 2004, and I thought, why the heck didn't I see it for what it was back then? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm completely with you on this, Mike. Uh, I actually remember your predecessor at the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign. You remember Gail Shea. Of course. And back in the 90s, I remember Gail was up in Oshkosh giving a presentation at the Oshkosh Public Library, and it was, you know, great presentation on the need to spur democracy at the grassroots. And there were a couple of people in the audience who kept raising their hands saying, "Are oh, you got this wrong. This is not a democracy. This is not a <laughs> democracy at all. And Gail wasn't flustered, but she kept like insisting that, look, the, the trajectory of this country is to struggle to expand the system to everybody. That's democracy. And I'm like you, Mike, it never occurred to me what was really going on here. It, it was this, this slow, willful effort to make us okay with what you're calling minority rule, right? The idea that you don't really need a majority, right? And you yeah. can rig the system so that the smallest amount of people can rule. You don't need to win the most votes to hold power <laughs> anymore. And, yeah. and because of a number of things, whether it's the gerrymandering of districts, and we've had repeated elections in Wisconsin, where collectively one party has won the most votes yep. for state assembly and state senate, but the other party has held the most seats. Election after election, that's the outcome. One party collectively wins the most votes, the other party wins the most seats. 
And you have, we, we've now had uh, repeated instances where we've had presidents elected who did not win the popular vote, didn't get the most votes, but still wound up in the White House. Of course, the courts have have supported all that because they've been well packed by people who, <laughs> who have this belief. And then, of course, there are all the laws and policies put in place to make it more difficult to vote, to express the popular will. And, and that, of course, led us all the way to what happened in 2016 and then particularly what happened in 2020. Mm -hmm. And then what happened on January 6th of 2021. And, and of course, you know, that, that was an attempted overthrow of the government. Uh, and, and, wow. you know, and it's amazing to me how many people don't see it as such. And I, I've actually lived in a country that went through a coup that, that had a government overthrown. Uh, and when I saw what happened on January 6th, I, I thought that, that there's an attempted coup. I mean, that's Which country was that, Mike? Tell us about I, that. I lived in Mali in West Africa oh, wow. for two years. And for, for quite a bit of the time that I was there, uh, Mali was a military dictatorship. So I've also experienced living in a military dictatorship. Mm -hmm. but, um, but toward the end of my two years living there, um, there was a, a coup that overthrew the government. Eventually, uh, there ended up being an, an elected National Assembly and an elected president. Mm -hmm. uh, that, has, that system has sort of fallen on hard times there. Uh, they've had a rocky road. But I, but I saw that kind of, of turmoil <clears throat> unfold. Right. Never thought when I was living there, this is from 1989 to 1991, I never thought that perhaps these kinds of things would unfold in my own country. Isn't that amazing? And, you know, it's easy, Mike, to think that this is primarily a Republican phenomenon, uh, you know, this kind of anti-small-D democratic thinking. But you wrote another Substack, uh, a blog post uh, that I found really uh, on point called Primary Numb Scullery, which <laughs> talked about the Democrats now are in this mode where they don't like competitive primaries anymore. Right. I mean, you know, candidates will get into the race and tell you they're the best, best person and I'm going to be there till the finish. And then a week, two weeks, three weeks before the election, they drop out. And so there's no, I mean, this happened with Joe Biden, right? Yeah. Right. We had Amy Klobuchar and Pete Buttigieg and a number of other candidates telling us they were so great. And then they all dropped out so that Biden would be able to win South Carolina. And it, ju it just happened in Wisconsin, too, yeah, with, exactly. with the senatorial candidates. Yeah, so. they all dropped out at the last minute. You know, the yeah. blog post I wrote really focused on the U.S. Senate race this year in Wisconsin. Yeah. But I, I think that president, the last presidential race was an even more powerful illustration of the point. Um, Joe Biden was finishing fourth or fifth in in state primaries. He, yes, he, wasn't, he, was. he wasn't winning those mm -hmm. states. He was sometimes finishing as low as fourth or fifth. And candidates who even were finishing ahead of him suddenly dropped out and they all rallied behind Joe Biden as the presumptive nominee. And, and uh, you know, in this case, polling was showing Mandela Barnes pulling ahead. Right. Uh, it was a close contest, but it looked like Barnes was starting to put some distance in between himself and, and the other people in the race. It still looked competitive. So it wasn't quite as dramatic as as people who were finishing ahead of Biden dropping out and throwing their support to Biden. <laughs> right. But, but it, it, it seemed to me like a, an unnecessarily, a, an unnecessary self-inflicted wound for the Democrats. <laughs> it made, you know, if, if you're a week and a half or two weeks out from the primary election, why send a message to voters, some of whom have all, had already voted because of early voting? Sure. Why send the message that your vote doesn't matter, that your participation in a in, in our democracy doesn't matter because we've already decided what the outcome is going to be. I, I, that's, that, that's so disrespectful to, to voters and sends such a horrible message when it comes to participation in our democracy. 
it, it you know that's why I referred to it as numbskullery. I, I really yeah. thought it was a stupid act, um, and and perhaps not as dramatic as as what happened in the presidential contest, but but another example where where the people in the party sort of get together and decide here's here's how we're going to do this. And they they don't respect the participation of voters. Yeah, and I I just find it just so distressing, Mike. That uh, like like for example, I I ran as a Green Party candidate in two thousand and four, and I got a lot of bitterness and resentment from Democrats. I didn't like it, but I kind of understand that, right? The Democrats yeah. think they're entitled to Green Party votes, but now we're seeing that kind of bitterness and resentment within the Democratic Party primary. Right. You know, especially aimed at progressive candidates. I mean, you know, we saw this when you ran for governor as a Democrat. Right. Yeah. At first, I didn't want to give you the voter list and all and all this kind of like nonsense. So so what happened to make the establishment hostile to competitive primaries? You know, it's almost like the establishment fears what voters might want. Yes, and, and they have it. They have it set in their heads what kind of candidate should be the party standard bearer. They 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 have it in their minds how everything should unfold, and they don't trust that voters will come to as enlightened a conclusion as right. as, as they have. And you know, when I ran for governor for months before the election, I was being asked to drop out. I know. I, you know, this was months before the election. <laughs> There were persistent questions. When are you going to drop out? You know, it's time to drop out. It's time to it's time for everybody to unite behind a nominee. My position was the time to unite behind a nominee is the day after the election. Yes. And, and you know, but not before the primary. And and I and I didn't drop out. I I ran to the finish line. And because I ran to the finish line, so did most of the others in that particular race, because I don't think they The party also didn't want a one-on-one contest between the eventual nominee and somebody like me. Mm -hmm. They didn't want the field cleared. So then everybody stayed in and and you ended up with 10 people on the ballot, but eight went all the way to the finish line. Yes. Um, Here you had, what was it, you know, six or seven people on the ballot, but, but, uh, almost all of them dropped out um, before the election and, and everybody just made Mandela Barnes, the presumptive nominee to me, that actually hurts Mandela Barnes. And if I were Mandela, I would be upset with the party and I would be upset with those other, with those other candidates because with a week and a half or two weeks to go, I think he was going to win the nomination. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But this almost made it look like, it almost made him look weaker than he actually is. It, it made it look like there were levers being pulled or there were there were skids being greased uh, for his nomination when he he would have I think he would have won it. He would have earned it um, if everybody had just competed right up through Election Day. Yeah, I, I agree, Mike. And I, and I think the worst thing that we can do, especially for young voters these days, is enforce this perception that the system is, in fact, rigged. Mm-hmm. Because there are so many people that are looking for an excuse not to participate in this. Exactly. Well, if you go Just back to the, the, the 2016, ahead, if you go back to the 2016, I mean, um, it, you know, they, they screwed over Bernie. You know, yeah. I think I think Bernie would have had a much better chance in beating Trump than, than Hillary. I mean, obviously, with all the email crap and everything going on. But with Wisconsin, what you know, I, I can't vote there, but. It, it, that's upsetting that, you know, all these folks dropped out, but as a radio host here, um, we interview these people, you know, I, I kind of pick some favorites and whatnot. And all of a sudden like they're gone. And I'm like, yeah. Oh man, like what was the interview for almost, you know, that's so that's kind of, I, mean, yeah. I feel a little bit that way, but. Well, well um, you know, and, and when you think about how viciously democracy is being assaulted in our country mm-hmm. and how there are these forces at work who, who really do want to usher in minority rule. They right. want to hold power even when they don't have the support of the people. When when you think about the viciousness of those assaults on our democracy, the last thing on earth that we need is a is another political party 
that is basically sending a message that your participation in, in an election doesn't matter because we've already got we've already settled on a nominee. That 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 is a horrible step to take, particularly at this moment when democracy is so vulnerable. Yes. Yeah. And, and we need a Democratic Party that is saying, doggone it. Come hell or high water, regardless of outcome, we are going to trust the wisdom of the people. We are yeah, going to, we are going to cast our lot with the people. What unfolded with this U.S. Senate election, unfortunately, sent the opposite message. The thing is, I'm, I'm sorry. The no. thing is, is that is that I was hearing from so many people expressing exasperation, frustration, anger, because some of them had already voted for one of the other candidates and, yeah. and realized now that their vote had been wasted. So I decided I'm going to say out loud what I think a lot of people are feeling. And I caught flack from, from, the, from the party establishment on this uh, for coming out and saying what I said on that blog post. But I decided, you know what? I, I think there are a lot of people feeling this way, and it deserves to be voiced. So I said out loud what what people were feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And, what you said and before, decided, I'll take the flag. Yeah, what you said before actually is terrifying. You're like they are afraid of what the voters might do. That that's horrifying. I mean, so so they're gonna they're gonna do whatever it is behind the scenes, and this is on both sides of things, obviously. That that they're gonna make those those decisions for us, and that's that. I mean, that's. I don't know. That, 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 to me, that's a very horrifying statement. Um, just to, like when you actually sit down and think about what that really means to the voter, you know, they're scared of what we're going to do. What, <laughs> some of them really should be, you know? Yeah. You know, Mike, it used to be that if a poll came out and it showed a candidate behind, what that meant was the candidate should probably work harder, try to get more support at the street level. What I'm what I'm finding now is, especially at these races like United States Senate and President, the poll now is telling them to drop out. I mean, that's what happened in Wisconsin. The the Marquette poll, which is the most reliable one in the state, came out and it showed that some of the candidates were, you know, not at double digits. And so what they pulled from that was, is I have no chance. And I, I mean, do you think that we maybe should I know this will never happen, but try to prevent polling from being used in these kind of elections? Yeah, I don't know how we do that. But right, I, exactly. I really wish, I really wish that that polling would would stop at some point. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and allow an election to play out. I, I I don't know how you achieve that. I don't know how you enforce it. But I I think what's unfortunate is that is that candidates um, apparently have a fragile enough egos yeah. that when they see when they see their poll numbers um, lagging, that they want to spare themselves the indignity of of being trounced in an election, um, and and to me, uh, you know, there are worse fates than losing an election. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and and you know, I think when you decide to put your name on the ballot, when you decide to put yourself out there as a candidate, uh, you have to. I think you have to be self assured enough and and. Uh, and you have to be comfortable enough in your own skin to accept whatever outcome comes your way. And, and if you get trounced, you, you just have to respect the mm -hmm. decision of the voters and, and move on. But, but you, you know, the last thing you should do is preemptively spare yourself some indignity. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and in so doing, basically tell voters, you know, those of you who supported me, who worked hard for me, who knocked on doors for me, who made phone calls for me, yeah. who worked your tails off for me, uh, your efforts really were in vain. And for all of you voters out there, it didn't really matter what you thought because because the the cop, the die was already cast. Yeah, that, exactly. That's, exactly. A, that's a horrible outcome. And it's, it's really disrespectful to voters. And I think the candidate should have the should have the both the nerve and and the you know the uh, you know the guts to see it through to the finish right. line regardless of what the outcome ends up being but now that mandela barnes is and he's the current lieutenant governor as you know now that he is the nominee for the united states senate on the democratic side and he's running against ron johnson the incumbent republican who promised he was only going to run for two terms so he broke that promise he's now running for a third term what do you see happening in that race, Mike? 
Well, you know, I, I've talked to so many people, you know, and, I've, and some people would, would tell me, oh, I think, I think Evers is going to coast to re-election, uh, but I'm not, really not sure about the U.S. Senate race. Mm -hmm. Others will say, I think, I think Johnson is going to lose, uh, you know, but, but I'm worried about that governor's race. To me, we live in a state that is so evenly divided that I can't help but think that regardless of who the candidates are, these elections are going to be pretty close to 50-50 outcomes. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, it. I, I think the reality, the people have become so tribal about their partisan allegiances that it doesn't really matter who is on the ballot or what they've said or what they've done or how badly they've messed up or if 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 somebody has the Republican label slapped on them, Republican voters are gonna are gonna rally behind that candidate. If the Demo and Democrats will go for the Democratic candidate, Man. and and our state is very evenly divided. And so you know, for all that talk you hear or used to hear a lot more, where I don't I don't vote for the party, I vote for the person. That's not really true today. No. Um, the tribal allegiances are very strong and it doesn't really matter whether somebody is totally ill-equipped or unqualified or has, has messed up badly in office. The people of that party will still stick with that person because they hate the other party yes. more than they love their own. So basically multi-millions of dollars are being spent to <laughs> get out the vote for each tribe. And to persuade a real small group of undecided voters, is that accurate? That's completely accurate. Yeah. Uh, what I'm afraid of is is yeah, that, and I think the theory was always that the millions of dollars were being spent on those on that small group in the middle. Yeah. But that group has become so small. Yes. It's become so yeah. tiny. Most people, even if they say that they're independents, they they have a loyalty to one tribe or the other because they hate the other tribe. Right. Yeah. Uh, but now those millions of dollars are really designed to just um, stoke fear and and uh, get people uh, in one tribe motivated to turn out because of the horrible possibility that the other tribe might might actually win and govern. That's sad. My, my fear with this is that Ron Johnson is going to start pulling what Trump did. I mean, as the election gets closer, he's going to talk about it already being rigged. You know, we've already done, you know, so many things to try to protect the election integrity, which they really haven't. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping those messages don't come out, you know, like like because you know, again, from even before the election, you know, Trump's like, oh, it's rigged. It's fixed and whatnot. But it only seems to be rigged and fixed when that side loses. You know, and that could go on either either way. Yep. So I, I, you know, has he? Have you noticed him doing anything like that yet? Not yet. Um, Ron Johnson uh, has proven to be a a, a very um, aggressive and and skillful campaigner in the past. He he was behind in the polls pretty significantly in his last election. He was he was down seven or eight points, perilously late in the election season ended up pulling out a victory. So I don't think that anybody can look at how, where the race stands today and count Ron Johnson out. He, yeah, I agree. He, he will be ruthless. He will, he will go negative. He will, he will employ the nuclear option uh, wow. in, in this campaign. If, uh, and, and probably you'll see race baiting and oh, yeah. you know, it'll always, it'll all be done with dog whistles and, and and some of the most vile stuff will be done by surrogates, but it will be done. Uh, so this is gonna this is gonna be an ugly race, uh, and I I think it's just inevitably going to be very close. Do Do you think that there's going to be any accountability for his what he's calling oh just a minor role in January sixth and trying to provide fake electors? Is there going to be any accountability there? Well, you know the the thing that I find both curious but also deeply troubling is that the people who are inclined to hold him accountable they were already convinced that that um that the insurrectionists need to go and that yeah. and and that um uh, what happened 
on January 6th of 2021 was was a criminal act. And they're, they're already convinced and they are already convinced that Ron Johnson uh, uh, is is a lousy U.S. senator and, and needs to be voted out. The people on the other side, his supporters, are continue to be inclined to think that January 6th was just a peaceful protest. Yeah. And, and, and they, they see things really differently. I was fascinated the other day when Laura Ingram, who is, 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 is a right wing wacko. She <laughs> comes out on, on her Fox show and says that the Republican party needs to move on from Donald Trump. I saw that. And, and she yeah. was blitzed. She was absolutely crucified on social media. And one of the comments that I saw more than once, repeatedly, I would hear people say that not only are we not moving on from Trump, Trump is the only one who can save our country, the only one who can prevent oh us from going the route of authoritarianism. Oh, good God. <laughs> Which that is was, exactly what he represents, and, authoritarianism. And, and, you know, I, and I think a, a lot of us would look at, at what Trump represents and say, this is the rise of fascism. This is uh, you know, this is moving us toward authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. But the people who defend him, the people who support him and support Ron Johnson, of course, as a result, they actually see him as the only hope of preventing authoritarianism. So that says to me that as a population, we have be, we have been so thoroughly propagandized that that people just see what they want to see and they see what the propaganda wow. that they are subjected to tells them they should be seeing. And that leaves us horribly divided without a common frame of reference. That, yes. That's one of the reasons why I say this is such a dangerous and perilous moment. Well, one last thing, Mike, before we, we let you go, you wrote another uh, great column called From Whence Redemption Comes. You know, we've been talking about politics but in that column, you cite a great book, a 2020 book uh, by Robert Putnam and Shailen Romney Garrett called The Upswing, where they try to argue that politics is actually a lagging indicator of what's going on in the country. Can you expand on that a little bit? It's a fascinating book. I highly yeah, it's recommend it's a great book. And they, you know, they uh, rely on a treasure trove of data. They are looking at at measurements of everything from income and wealth inequality to baby name preferences. They're looking at charitable <laughs> giving. They're looking yeah. at tax rates. They're, and, and in every case, what they show is that over the last 125 years, that all of these measuring sticks show the same thing, that we have gone from being what they refer to as a me society around the time of the Gilded Age in the late 19th century yep. to a we society in the aftermath of the Great Depression and World War II and have, have then gone back to being a me society again. But one of the interesting things that they find is that they look at social, economic, cultural measures, and then they also look at political measures. What they find is that the political indicators don't show the change until about 15 years after all those other measures indicate the change. So Correct. going from a me society to a we society and then back to a me society, those shifts didn't show up in the political measures until about 15 years after they showed up in all of the other measures. And I thought, you know, that's we we tend to think that. Reagan's election in 1980 was a pivotal turning point in our society. Yep. What all their measures show is that we had actually started toward this, this uh, individualism, this self-centeredness, this, this me kind of orientation around 1965. Yeah. That's when wow. All the other measures started to show that, that shift occurring. It didn't manifest itself in our politics until probably the 80 election of Ronald Reagan. Yep. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. Mike, uh, always a joy to have you here. And once again, we want to uh, urge our readers to go to mikemccabe.substack.com uh, where you can get free access to all of his uh, columns. Mike, thank you so much. And so uh, much, we Mike. look forward to having you back again soon. Been a delight. I look forward to it. 
Tony, uh, like I say, almost every time, another fantastic interview. I'm, I'm so um, inspired by Mike. The fact that he's got such a finger on the pulse of what's going on. And, and this, this blog is fantastic. Yeah, Mike is always on point and he's a genuine Wisconsin progressive. Always great to hear his insights. And once again, I just encourage people, we'll, we'll put the link on our on our YouTube channel, yeah. mikemccabe.substack.com. Uh, his, his work is always so readable. Yeah. And it's not like it's, it's a really, it's not like this really long, it, it's, right. it's got the heart of what you want in in a very quick read. So I do encourage everybody to check it out. Yeah. So, most of his posts are anywhere from like 500 to a thousand words and, yeah. and just, just filled with the uh, insight. So yeah, it'll help people to stay elevated. Yeah, absolutely. Until next time, everybody stay <laughs> elevated. We'll see you stay elevated. <laughs>